I feel like 2015 was the beginning of the end for us. The beginning of the end of good entertainment, the beginning of the end of stories being front and center in all movies produced and released, the beginning of the end of likable female characters, the beginning of the end of masculine men, and just the beginning of the end of sanity in general. It was hard to see at first. Most movies weren't making waves in the culture war like they are right now, and were staying under the radar with their marketing campaigns. For the most part, people kept their mouths shut about their agendas, and the audience went along with the strange new changes that, while not really making sense, seemed harmless in the long run. Boy, were we wrong. But in order to discuss just how bad things have gotten, we need to take a quick look at just how good things were. Modern Hollywood and its feminist cohorts seem to have forgotten that women have been integral parts of movies for decades. They have inhabited major roles, been women of power, and somehow, despite all of that, have possessed the ability to love and protect others, sometimes at great personal cost to themselves. They felt fear and sadness, pain and sorrow, joy and rage in equal measure, and despite being faced with horrific odds, managed to retain their humanity and a strict moral code even when things around them seemed hopeless. They never gave up, never stopped fighting, and were pretty awesome doing it. One of my favorite female characters that demonstrated this was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I was obsessed with her and her slayer abilities. Coupled with the fact that she was also trying to be a regular high school girl, it made for a great story that was full of love, heartache, teenage angst, and a lot of silliness. I particularly loved her relationship with Angel. I don't know when exactly the turning point was, when the deep dive into ideological pandering and man-hating and female entitlement came from, but somewhere between 2017 and 2019 is when the alarms first began to sound. There are a few specific ways in which feminism has ruined Hollywood, and if I were to talk about them all in one video, it would be hours long. So I have decided to split them into a series. This first video will focus primarily on the writing and characterization of certain individuals, before moving on to the actresses themselves that have perpetuated this cycle of creative bankruptcy and character assassinations, and then the politics that have allowed this to be so. Everything is a hierarchy, it would seem, and today we're starting from the bottom and working our way to the top. The Last Jedi is a good example, a movie that is so polarizing to fans that to this day some people still deny its existence and call it fan fiction. That movie was a bit more subtle in the female entitlement department, Admiral Holdo aside. Rey was a character who didn't demand anything and didn't call herself a better version of her male counterpart, Luke, but she also implied that she didn't need him to be a teacher to her. I need someone to show me my place in all this. This line is interesting because it suggests that Rey doesn't need instruction at all, but someone to put her in the best position to be her true self. She implies that she has a seat at the table already and that she just needs to be shown that table. While this line is not outrightly prideful, it does imply a sense of entitlement that is often overlooked. And that's how feminism began to get a hold in Hollywood, with lines of dialogue that don't look like much when said, but when broken down, hint at more feminist leanings. Ryan Johnson all but admitted that his whole goal with this movie was to make OG Star Wars fans mad, and the dialogue was just one of the many ways in which he did that. Of course, the trend continued with projects like Batwoman, a show that was thankfully cancelled after two seasons that were the television equivalent of a colonoscopy given in a back alley in Gotham. Batwoman was probably the most egregious example of toxic feminism in TV up until that point. There was nothing subtle about it. Every word out of Kate Kane's mouth was self-aggrandizing, self-congratulatory, entitled, disdainful nonsense. Others compared her even to Bruce Wayne. You're a female Bruce Wayne. Awesome. Hilarious. Handsome. Excuse me while I hurl. As if Kate Kane is worthy of standing in the same room as Batman, let alone taking up his mantle. In all actuality, this show was filled with so many omens that we could expect from the future of female characters in Hollywood that I wish we could be clairvoyant and somehow put a stop to this nonsense with our mouths and our wallets. Kate Kane was the forerunner of women taking credit for men's work, women acting entitled when they have done nothing to earn the mantles that they have stolen, and women demanding attention simply because they are women. Not only was the writing abhorrent and abysmal, 
the characters that were responsible for saying those lines didn't do themselves any favors at all. I can think of far too many characters who have fallen into the trap of stoicism and nonconformity to any sort of nuance in the last 10 years, and it has only become more and more egregious the longer that it has been allowed. Let's examine the language of some of the women from ages past who were not only well-written, but they were women that anyone could admire and aspire towards while still having power and the ability to wield it in large amounts. Galadriel, for example, the good one, not the psychopath from Rings of Power, is one character that I will always admire. Every line that she speaks is poignant and worth reflecting on. She truly understands that each person has their own journey to embark on and does her best to provide encouragement, comfort, and peace during trying times. She doesn't attempt to shoehorn her way into the fellowship, recognizing that all have their journey to play, and her encouragement displays this very well. Contrast this with psychopath Galadriel's words to her troops when they are exhausted in the north looking for traces of Sauron. We should never have come in here. We leave soon enough. The order is given. We march at first light. Also, take notice of the fact that this Galadriel is not called Lady. You can draw your own conclusions from this subtle bit of language, but the new Galadriel is called Commander, a title that denotes a rank of power. The term Lady used in that context denotes nobility, a woman of grace and bearing and regality. Psychopath Galadriel is none of those things, so the best they can do is to remove her femininity and replace it with expressions of dominance, because power is the only truth that modern feminists know. Contrast this knowledge with this scene from The Fellowship of the Ring, when Lady Galadriel is offered all the power in the world and goes through a great deal of temptation before choosing to give it up. In place of a dark lord, you would have a queen! Not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the dawn! See, what Lady Galadriel and the audience understand, and what psychopath Galadriel and modern feminism do not, is that power is corrosive and often leads to despair and destruction. The entire concept of Lord of the Rings, while being an epic story of good versus evil, is about the corruptive nature of the ring, and by extension, the corruptive nature of power. The ring whispers in the ear of its bearer about all the things it can do for its wearer, all the secret wishes and innermost desires that it will provide if it is just used. As it turns out, psychopath Galadriel does not need a ring because she gives into her most violent and carnal desires already. The words she uses, the anger she displays, her uncaring and uncompassionate nature make her another sad example of how Hollywood feminists have ruined what was once a remarkable character. You see, Hollywood feminism is obsessed with concepts of inequality and correcting what they perceive to be imbalances wherever they can. Even if a female character that was present in a major franchise like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings but did not play a significant role like the guys did, this is an imbalance of the highest proportions to them and needs to be corrected right away. Take Princess Leia, for example. While her role in the original trilogy was much smaller than Luke's, she was still significant to both her brother and Han. She was not a weak character and was responsible for the Death Star's plans getting to the needed recipients. She didn't balk in the face of Darth Vader and was quite a good shot with a blaster. She was courageous and didn't back down from anything, but she also understood her role and the part she had to play in the war. And this was a serious imbalance that Hollywood feminism had to correct. In the new Obi-Wan Kenobi series, the titular character is dragged from Tatooine due to the machinations of another brainchild of the insane Hollywood feminism cult. Leia is front and center in that series. For the most part, it's her leading Obi-Wan around by the nose and him believing in her and giving her credit for things that no 10-year-old should know how to do or be believed about. She is a child. She has no business ordering adults around. Obi-Wan has little to no reason to trust her since she showed her lack of self-preservation skills to him earlier in the show by running from him, and her entire character and the language that she uses is about power and the amount of it she is going to wield someday. Luke is, however, denoted as being a foolish boy who runs away from his family, has no ability to think on his feet like Leia does, and who is scared, lost, and confused. Everything he learns to fight against and overcome in the original story. But perhaps the most vindictive way in which Hollywood feminism got its claws into the Obi-Wan show was its portrayal of Reva 
and how she somehow got the knowledge that Luke was Darth Vader's progeny and went to Tatooine to kill him. The show made it clear that the only reason Luke survived to live to adulthood so that he could face Darth Vader and the Emperor was due to the actions of a woman. A woman chose to spare his life, and so by that paradigm, she is the reason that Darth Vader was ultimately defeated, because if Luke died early, no one else could have done it. All hail Reva, the savior of the galaxy. The writing of these feminists is the most subtle way in which characters and stories and franchises are ruined. Of course, you have the belligerent dialogue of Batwoman and the insane ravings of the madwoman Galadriel. But when you examine the subtler moments of text between women characters towards each other, and the men as well, as examine the motivations that they are given and the circumstances that they are provided with, a more malicious picture begins to emerge. Women have essentially become a protected class in Hollywood, a hierarchy unto themselves that are exempt from blame, retribution, restitution, and accountability. I've talked at length about some of the more egregious examples, but there are some other ones that range from eye roll inducing to downright disgusting. Riva is of course one of them. She is the least of the Inquisitors, put down by her male colleagues for being less worthy than they are, and having to prove herself in a man-dominated world. She is a female of color also, so that of course adds another layer of victimhood to her character, because the writers wanted to put her as part of a marginalized group, so that she has even more reasons to be as angry as she does at the people who have wronged her and not be held accountable for them. She's angry because she's been put down and abused, made that way by the people that took her and trained her. None of it was of her own volition, none of it was by her choice or design, and she is completely justified in blaming everyone but herself for her problems. And no one else, especially not Obi-Wan Kenobi, a legacy character beloved by all, can blame her either which is why he absolves her of every wrongdoing and lets her go from Tatooine, despite the fact that she now has dangerous information that could get him and the twins killed if she is caught. She's incapable of dying either, apparently, despite suffering the same wounds that Qui-Gon Jinn did twice over. Additionally, if we were to look at the so-called villain of the Black Widow movie, Taskmaster, instead of using the comic villain Anthony Masters, who was a former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent turned mercenary and assassin, with the unique ability to replicate the physical skills of anyone that he observes, they chose to instead make Taskmaster female, the daughter of Drakov, the other villain of the movie, and who chose to make her into who she is after the actions of Black Widow nearly killed her. The writing pushes so hard the concept of all female villains not having a choice in their actions or justifying them due to the choices of others that no female can commit a wrong anymore because they are a protected class. Murder can be brushed aside, genocide can be overlooked, rage and anger to the point of insanity are all normal things, and there are no consequences for anyone in the writing at all, because nothing is ever wrong. Mark Twain famously once said that anger is an acid, but it seems as if Hollywood feminist writers have never heard of the saying before, because to them, anger and power are the only truths that are worth adhering to. Thanks so much for watching this video, guys. What are your thoughts on feminism ruining Hollywood through writing? Be sure to tell me your thoughts down in the comments section below, and let's have a conversation about it. Until next time, everyone.